Since 2002, Joslin Art Museum has been satisfying visitors' cravings for delicious art, fine food, and great conversation at Appetite for Art. Over the years, museum directors and curators have offered stimulating gallery talks, followed by meals inspired by masterpieces. This is Taylor Acosta, Joslin's Associate Curator of European Art. While we are not able to be together for this final program of the season, I am pleased to present a virtual gallery talk on Maria van Osterwijk's Still Life of Flowers in a Glass Vase, painted in 1685. Today, a vase of cultivated flowers is appealing, pretty, or even banal. But for a Dutch person in the 17th century, a single cultivar could be rich in association. The possible connotations included moral virtue or failure, bearers of divine messages, reminders of the transitory nature of life and inevitability of death. As luxury objects, tulips in particular fit well into a culture of both abundant capital and new cosmopolitanism. They required expertise and appreciation of beauty and the exotic and great wealth. Indeed, flowers were complex historical objects in this golden age. Over the course of the 17th century, the Dutch nation became one of the wealthiest and most powerful in the world employing its naval prowess to dominate international trade and create a vast colonial empire. The Dutch Golden Age was a period in which Dutch trade, science, military, and art were among the most acclaimed in the world. But this period began in turmoil. The 1568 Revolt of the 17 Provinces, modern-day Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and sections of northern France and western Germany, against Philip II of Spain, the sovereign of the Habsburg Netherlands, led to the Eighty Years' War. Under William of Orange, the northern provinces overthrew the Habsburg armies and established the Republic of the Seven United Netherlands, which in 1648 was recognized as an independent country. The prosperity of this new country engendered great advancements in the arts. With surplus income, Dutch citizens purchased paintings and works of decorative art, prompting an enormous surge in art production in an unprecedented variety of types and levels of quality. We now celebrate this golden age and artists like Rembrandt, Franz Hals, and Vermeer. The art of the golden age, though, was not monolithic. In fact, 17th century Dutch artists engaged in fierce debates about matters of style. Some artists emphasized painting's ability to imitate nature, while others contended that painting should imitate the perfection of classical antiquity. There was also a broad trend of diversification of subject matter that included portrait, still life, landscape, animal painting, and scenes of everyday life. Such secular specialization was a response to the decrease in religious commissions following the Protestant Reformation and the increase in disposable income among the upper and middle classes. Another favorite genre that was very much tied to contemporary culture and values was the floral still life. Indeed, there was a kind of flowering of Dutch flower painting between 1600 and 1720. Although paintings from the mid-16th century featured displays of flowers, the floral still life only gained prominence as an independent genre in the first years of the 17th century. Flower paintings could be seen as depictions of luxury commodities, idealized collections of coveted blooms, reminders of the fleeting nature of time, and bearers of moral messages from God. They were also appreciated as powerful works of art, evaluated on the basis of mimetic success and visual pleasure. Throughout the 17th century, Dutch flower painters depicted rarer and more diverse specimen, perfected a number of pictorial devices to create convincing illusions of three dimensions, and added an elegance of design to concentrate more on decorative effect. The floral still life was not an art of transcription, but an art of illusion. The earliest flower paintings reflected the concerns of gentlemen botanists. The genre was principally initiated by Jan Bruegel the Elder and Ambrosius Boschert the Elder. In these pictures, the arrangements are flat, symmetrical, and suffused with even light. Individual flowers do not overlap so that each may be studied in the manner of a preserved specimen. Jan David's de Heem, who rose to prominence in the 1630s, introduced greater naturalism to the genre by bringing a full range of color to his canvases, sophisticated lighting with highly focused spotlights, greater spatial unity, and clustered compositions, deliberately using compositional devices like asymmetry and overlapping. Willem van Els, based in Amsterdam, developed elegant designs with a signature trope of flowers cascading down. 
by the 18th century, there was a significant shift in flower painting. These compositions are larger, lighter in tone, grander, and almost impossibly complex. Exotic pineapples suddenly appear, perched precariously amid the blooms. Everywhere, the decorative quality of the flower painting is emphasized and pronounced, in keeping with the prevailing new taste for the Rococo. It is within this sketch of the development of Dutch flower painting that I should now introduce Maria van Osterwijk, whose work is at once characteristic of the genre at its peak and also unique to her artistic talents. Maria van Osterwijk was born in Nootdorp, a village near Delft in the south of Holland, the daughter of clergyman Jacob van Osterwijk. Little is known about her early training. In 1658, she moved to Leiden, and in 1660, she relocated to Utrecht, where she likely studied with the still-life painter Jan Davids de Heem. According to an early biography, Van Osterwijk chose de Heem because he was an esteemed and able teacher. In 1666, she settled in Amsterdam, where she likely encountered the prominent still-life painter Willem van Elst though the nature of their relationship is unknown, as contemporary accounts vary. There is a dispute recorded between their housemaids concerning a coat. This report developed into an anecdote about a refused proposal of marriage, which was recorded by a contemporary writer and thence repeated in several biographies and even elaborated into a romance novel published in the 19th century, as well as an English-language short story titled Love Among the Lilies, published in both Chambers Journal and Harper's Weekly in 1861. That story begins, Like a prisoned poet inscribing eloquent odes to liberty, Maria van Osterwijk, pent in the center of grim old frowning Delft, strove passionately to fix upon her canvas the glorious flowers and fruits of a far-off country, from which the town's every canal, lock, street, wall, and rampart combined to sunder her. By aid of memory, Scrap sketches made on hurried visits beyond the gates and cut flowers sickening and dying as she drew them, the pale, earnest-looking lady worked on. With quite a lily's whiteness in her face and fair, waving hair that seemed sprinkled with the gold dust from the lily's cup, pushed back carelessly so as not to hinder her, and in sober, dark woolen dress, only relieved by the large, plated, muslin ruff collar, Maria bent her lithe, fragile figure before her easel, poring over one of the small cabinet paintings whose transparent color, refined taste, and delicate mechanism shall make them years and years after thou art dust, Maria van Osterwijk, cherished possessions even in the choicest collections. Active from the early 1660s until about 1690, van Osterwijk enjoyed enormous success as a flower painter. Her patrons included Louis XIV of France, Emperor Leopold I, and the Stadtholder King William III and Queen Mary Stuart. Van Osterwijk painted lively and elegant still life set against dark backgrounds. Her work is characterized by a unique style and refined technique, marked especially by thoughtful detail, careful lighting, and fine brushwork. Her only pupil was her housemaid, Gerta Peters, whose work is now represented in the Fitzwilliam Museum at the University of Cambridge. Maria Van Osterwijk was known to have been very pious, she never married, and she died at the age of 63. Still Life of Flowers in a Glass Vase entered Jocelyn's collection in 2019. The loosely arranged bouquet consists of roses, tulips, apple blossom, morning glory, periwinkle, lilac, iris, carnation, hollyhock, columbine, and larkspur, which appear in different states of bloom in a short reflective glass vase. Butterflies, a bumblebee, and other insects settle on several flowers, and five assorted shells and an additional butterfly appear in the foreground on a marble ledge inscribed with the artist's name. Light falls from the upper left. There is a dramatic contrast between foreground and background as the flowers emerge from deep shadow in highly saturated tones. The placement of larger and smaller blooms around a central gathering creates a sense of depth, and the interweaving of stems and long grasses throughout the arrangement lends additional clarity to the spatial relationships. The meticulous attention to detail and precise application of paint heighten the apparent realism. The artist likely maintained a portfolio of individual floral studies that she employed in various combinations in her paintings, a practice which allowed her to represent different cultivars at or near their peak of perfection without the limitations posed by availability and seasonality. Although the repetition of certain motifs may make it difficult to date her work, 
the style and handling of the present painting suggest it was executed in the second half of the 1680s. Of the known works in Van Ostewick's oeuvre, the peasant painting is one of the most significant in terms of quality and scale. Another unique feature of this painting is its frame, which is original and includes metal hooks to which a rod with a silk curtain would have been attached. In 17th century Holland, curtains served to protect paintings from exposure to light, smoke, and accidental scratches. At the same time, the act of drawing back the curtain also added a sense of drama to the unveiling and underscored the importance of the work of art as it was only to be revealed to a select audience. While the practice of covering paintings with curtains was not uncommon in Holland in the 17th century, finding a frame with its original metal hooks like this is exceedingly rare. In the case of still life of flowers in a glass vase, a new rod and green silk curtain have been fabricated according to historical examples. This restoration makes it possible for a contemporary audience to experience the work as it would have been originally displayed. Thank you for joining me for this virtual gallery talk. I hope it has inspired you to take a closer look at this painting now from a distance and hopefully again soon in the gallery. I look forward to seeing you in the fall for another season of Appetite for Art.